Hello and welcome to the Friends 24 interview. Our guest today is Glenn Greenwald. He's an American lawyer turned journalist who was part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team in 2014 for his role in the revelations about US surveillance and contractor Edward Snowden. He has uh, co-founded uh, The Intercept, an investigative uh, news outlet, and he's been living for several years in Brazil. He joins us from Rio de Janeiro. Thank you very much for being with us today, Mr. Greenwald. Good to be with you. Mr. Greenwell, obviously you've kept a close eye on what's happening in the US. You've been a vocal critic of uh, the left and the media's so-called obsession with Russia's alleged uh, ties to uh, President Trump. Uh, I want to begin with the killing of George Floyd in Minnesota. It has a legion wa a wave of protest across the US and even uh, beyond. But I want to ask you about something Susan Rice, who was President Obama's national security advisor, said she suggested that Russia was steering up the protest and that based on her experience, I'm quoting her now, this is right out of the Russian playbook. I would not be surprised to learn that they have fomented some of the extremists on both sides or that they funded this in some way, shape or form. What's your reaction? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it, it reflects a real sickness um, in American political culture and in American political discourse, particularly among the Democrats ever since 2016, when they lost an election that they obviously never should have lost to somebody who was a game show host and a joke and a clown. Instead of trying to examine what they did wrong, what has gone wrong in their politics, Remember, Donald Trump won after Barack Obama governed the country for eight years. So instead of asking what has gone wrong with neoliberal ideology, with the Democratic Party, they instead decided to blame everything on this foreign villain in Moscow, the same one that the United States spent decades blaming for every one of their problems throughout the Cold War. And so even now, when you see these protests emerging out of systemic racism that has existed in the United States since its founding and has never been cured, Democrats like Susan Rice and many others can't accept responsibility that maybe there's something wrong with the United States that's causing this. They have to instead blame Russia. It's a crazy conspiracy theory, but it's one that has become very common and normalized in American discourse. Do you accept the notion that uh, Russia uh, played a role in the 2016 election as uh, claimed several times, and not only by the Democrats but, or by the intelligence community, or do you think uh, this is a fantasy or a conspiracy theory, as you just described it? Well, the United States and Russia and other great powers like China and Iran and many others interfere in the domestic politics of each other and have been doing that for decades. So I don't doubt that the that the Russians might have used some Facebook ads or Twitter bots or even been responsible for the dissemination of emails. Um, but compared to what the United States has done and gets to do in terms of interfering in the affairs of other countries, including Russia, you know, the United States on the cover of Time magazine celebrated in 1996 how it was U.S. consultants who helped put Boris Yeltsin in the presidency because of the expectation that he would privatize everything and bring usher in a, an era of neoliberalism that would benefit U.S. business, or even in 2010 and 2012, when the State Department under Hillary Clinton was helping to fund and uh, support anti-Putin protest groups. In the scheme of how the United States and Russia interferes in one another's politics, this is very trivial, what is being alleged, even if it's all true. It's, again, just an attempt to shift blame away from any attempt to engage in self-analysis and self-criticism and pin it on a foreign power, something that all failed governments and failed ideologies love to do is to say, hey, it's not our fault. Let's unite in opposition to this foreign enemy over there. Uh, I want to uh, get back to the current uh, protest. Uh, would you say Donald Trump uh, might be losing the election right now, or actually the divisiveness uh, that he has used over and over again uh, might help him uh, pull out another upset in uh, November? It's, it's hard to say. You know, in, in the 1960s, there's no question that the riots and protest and social disorder that came about because of the civil rights movement and the reaction to it, the Vietnam War, the assassination of Martin Luther King, created a perception among a lot of Americans that there was insufficient law and order in the United States. And that enabled a right-wing candidate, Richard Nixon, 
to win the presidency in 1968 on a platform of bringing in more authoritarianism, strengthening the police, four years after a massive landslide the Democrats won under Lyndon Johnson. And so there is a fear that when there's social unrest, it can strengthen an authoritarian who says, I'm going to deploy the military onto the streets. I'm going to crush the protesters. I'm going to keep you safe. But I really doubt that this can work this time because so many Americans across the political spectrum have seen so many of these instances now because things are captured on video in a way that they weren't even 10 years ago of the police using unrestrained violence against innocent people and particularly African Americans that the cause of the protests are so is so just and people see that the overwhelming majority of protesters and protests are in fact peaceful that I do feel like the perception will be not for Trump's base obviously that will love his rhetoric but for independents and people who aren't firmly in one camp or the other that Trump is essentially making it worse. And so I think he's in very dangerous political uh, ground because of uh, the climate that has arisen in the United States because of this. Right. Uh, you mentioned uh, Trump uh, uh, saying that he might send uh, the military out on, on the streets. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, this is a thing that we're seeing uh, in other places, including uh, where you are uh, in Brazil, where President uh, Bolsonaro, clearly uh, there is only a certain extent to which you can parallel both situations. Uh, but what's your take on uh, Trump uh, threatening with the military, Bolsonaro and his supporters also uh, playing uh, this card? Well, anytime the government deploys the military onto its own streets against its own citizens, it's a huge threat to individual liberty, to democratic values, and to having a republic that operates according to the rule of law. That is not what a military is for. A military is not for shooting at um, and, and, and using force against one's own citizens on one's own territory. It's used to fight against foreign powers who are threatening your country. So any even hint of the military is going to be deployed is already a grave threat to notions of core freedoms and core liberties. Um, so for Trump to do that is something that's extremely alarming, not just because of the potential that it has to bring in a kind of authoritarianism or even tyranny to the United States and to its largest cities, but also because of its ability to give a signal to other leaders around the world that also want to do that. As you mentioned, even before, well before this happened, Jair Bolsonaro, who was elected um, as president of Brazil, the world's fifth largest country in late 2018, is somebody who has long said for years that he believed military dictatorship, which ruled Brazil for 21 years until 1985, was a superior form of government to democracy. And he's been looking for an excuse, any excuse, because Congress has been impeding his agenda, the media has been very oppositional to him, to just impose dictatorial order. And he was part of the military that ruled the country for 21 years after they toppled democracy and wants to bring that about. And so seeing the president of the most important or most powerful, richest and most powerful country in the world, send the military onto the streets is very alarming for those of us who live in countries where democracy and democratic institutions are much weaker, but where we have presidents or political movements that are in power and that want to do the same thing. Well, uh, how real is the threat of a kind of a stealth coup uh, going on in Brazil? Uh, as you mentioned, we've seen this videotape of Bolsonaro at a cabinet meeting lashing out. We've seen generals kind of threaten or hit that, you know, if things get out of control because of protests, of his handling of the COVID-19 crisis and other issues of corruption, well, they might take their matters into their own hands. Yeah, I mean, all of this began because President Bolsonaro's son, Flavio, who is who was elected as a senator in the same election that President Bolsonaro was elected to the presidency, is enmeshed in an extremely serious corruption scandal. And the federal police have been investigating it very aggressively. The family has links to militias that rule Brazil with violence um, to paramilitary gangs. And a lot of Bolsonaro's uh, motivation is to gain control of these institutions so that they're no longer independent but are under his control, including the police and the courts and the media, in order to protect his own family from being held accountable for serious criminality. 
And so when you combine that motive, which obviously is very strong for anybody to protect your own sons who have been caught red handed um, engaging in serious crimes with this ideology that says that democracy ushers in communism, that it is messy and disorderly, that the military is able to rule Brazil in a much more efficient and healthier way, which is what his ideology has been for 30 years. The danger, especially when you add to it things like everybody being confined to their homes, people losing their jobs by the millions, a global pandemic, now they're starting to be conflicts on the streets between fascist groups and anti-fascist groups of the kind that was motivated by the protests in the United States that have spread elsewhere, including to, to France, I know. Um, the the situation is very, very dangerous. It's very, very volatile. Is democracy um, in danger you know, you in do Brazil? Have courts in Congress. Yeah, absolutely. It's in danger in Brazil. You know, when you start, when the, when the question starts to be, is the military on Bolsonaro's side or is the military on the side of democracy, which is the question that everybody's asking, it already means that democracy is so threatened that it's essentially in the hands of the military to decide. And that's something that the world should really care about because Brazil is a very influential country with a lot of important assets, including the Amazon. And to watch democracy disappear in Brazil could be something that could have really serious repercussions for the world. Glenn Greenwald, thank you very much. That's all we have time for. And thank you for watching this interview here on France 24.